When I was a child, I had an imaginary friend, a little girl named Piti. She had dark hair that framed her round face. She had round glasses. She wore a safari outfit and a safari hat to match. The way she communicated with me was through bright living colors that swallowed up my entire world. She would abduct my attention and seduce me on imaginative safaris to worlds beyond the physical. She was so real to me that I had convinced my mother to put an extra dinner plate at the table every night. <laughs> this continued until the educational world drew me out into an external reality. And the warm, colorful inner lights were replaced by cold institutional fluorescence that sought to structure and constrict my creative autonomy with their culturally imposed norms. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that idea. Nowadays, there's plenty of us traveling from the eBay to the Amazon, trying to heal, <laughs> trying to heal their uh, cultural ailments on the Shipibo patch. Uh, when I say Shipibo patch, I'm talking about those little embroidered shamanic doilies with visual representations of the Ikaros, which are the shaman's healing songs. Now, I personally never had a very uh, traditional or conventional introduction to ayahuasca. For me, the year was 2003. I was 21 years old. I had recently moved from the Netherlands and was living with my father in Miami, Florida. I had a girlfriend who was a kindred creative spirit. And together, we had been hanging out with this self-proclaimed shaman in his mid to late 40s. You can picture this guy slightly resembling Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> Bald head, wire frame spectacles, a dark mustache, and below his lower lip a little soul patch. You know, like one of those sag down Hitler mustaches, just to, <laughs> just to keep things paradoxically balanced. Now, this guy is blowing smoke into little plastic ayahuasca party cups. <laughs> While behind him, his green plumed parrot with the uh, angelic name is chattering in psychotic, demonic tongues. In front of him on the table is a bottle of ayahuasca, the bottle genie that promised to take us to a whole new world on a magic carpet ride through a Persia of purging. <laughs> and so I was introduced to ayahuasca. The first time I drank it, it tasted slightly like a liquefied corpse or the essence of a person with a slight hint of licorice. <laughs> and so I lay down, and about 20 minutes later, a small flying saucer hovered over my head, shot open my third eye, and a face-filled vision of turquoise and orange energy flowed before me. I felt the vine familiarizing itself with my brain as its vessel, like a puppeteer sliding its hand into the puppet to familiarize itself with its penetralia. <laughs> there was some dry telepathic small talk, like this was my first routine checkup at the Transcendentist. <laughs> and it opened up little cabinets in my mind, exploring the unfoldings of energy and process. It said, oh, well, it looks like um, there's a vibe settling between your girlfriend and the shaman, so a relationship is probably on the way. <laughs> well, it looks like your car engine might fail later tonight. That'll stir things up nicely. <laughs> well, you certainly have enough creative aspirations that we can expand upon. Well, it looks like we got our work set out for us. Check in with me next week and we'll get you a psycho-spiritual root canal. <laughs> One week later, we had our second ceremony. 
This one served as a psycho-spiritual root canal, <laughs> seeking to uproot me from my by then unhealthy attachments to my lover as primary external source of inspiration, seeking to heal my attachmental ailments. The visions bloomed like an umbilical connection, like messages sent on a blood-streaming media, the original plasma screen seeing through mother's eyes, through a crystalline web with rainbow fluids flowing behind it, like a, a stained glass mosaic of colored burning coals burning onto my mind's eye. It imparted its intentions through a sort of multidimensional telepathy, through subtle fluctuations in color and in texture. This communication swallowed up my entire world. It was so familiar to me because it reminded me of Piti, the little girl with the dark hair, the round face, the round glasses, the safari outfit, who would seduce me into worlds beyond the material. Ayahuasca was seeking to relay my relationship from my lover as an external source of inspiration and reacquaint me with my anima, that inner feminine receptive creative force. This shook me up to such a degree that I decided to quit my job. I was working in a pawn shop at the time. <laughs> And I decided that I wanted to follow this path to Brazil, to continue working with ayahuasca. But not until I would have one more ceremony in Miami. When this last ceremony arrived a few weeks later, my girlfriend was no longer my girlfriend. She was by now pretty much the shaman's wife. <laughs> and I now engaged to my internal muse drank the brew, lay down, and inquiring into the secrets of joy, took leave of my body on a rainbow serpent roller coaster ride, free flowing through the cosmos. Free flowing until it would land me it to a halt in a vault of stagnancy. Within this vault of stagnancy, a single thought tried to make up my entire life. It didn't matter what the thought was. It only mattered that it was like a wrench clogging the cogs and gears of this smoothly oiled cosmic machine. And beyond its boundaries, I could still see the cosmic serpent roller coaster roll on without me. And then I'd be back in it. And then I'd be back in this vault of stagnancy. And then I'd be free flowing again, and then I'd be back. And I started paying attention to how I was able to find my way out of the stagnancy back into the free flow. And what it showed me was how to take this thought and how to smudge it over eternity, how to stretch it like a smile and continue my free flow. I awoke from this blissful dissociative reverie with a giant smile on my face and felt a distinct clingy energy, like cobwebs sticking to my aura. These were societal impositions. These were familial concerns. These were all the things that were not me. I followed this feeling deep into the darkness of my guts. When I attained unity with the darkness, rainbow light came pouring in from all sides, pushing up the darkness to my head and exploding with bells and whistles and a carnival of demons, angels and deities, and of course, full force volcanic vomit. <laughs> now, like I said, this was a non-traditional setting, so the only Icaros I had at my command were bastardized pop songs like, I drank it down, but I threw up again because I'm never gonna keep it down. <laughs> Afterwards, I felt light in every sense of the word. I felt weightless and luminous. I felt like myself. I turned to a Jungian analyst who had been journeying with us, asked him about his experience, and he said, oh, it's been wonderful. I've been seeing a lot of the things that you paint, 
And I thought, oh, right, I was a painter. I forgot about that. I excused myself, and I turned back inwards as an explorer now. And I directed my inquiries at the crystal, coral, clouded sphinx gods that hovered before me. Their bodies were like glass ice with flashes of aurora borealis going off inside of them. And I said, the beauty you've shown me, these worlds of color and texture, if you can show me how to bring these back, I will be your messenger. I'm sure you've heard of a speed painting tutorial. Well, this was a light speed painting tutorial. At the speed of light, color and texture overwhelmed me faster than I could comprehend. But in the days that followed, as I started painting, I felt like a fearless color god. I felt like Neo in The Matrix after he's downloaded his new program. I know Kung Fu. <laughs> I showed the new works to my father told him I'd been working with a shamanic hallucinogen and was planning to continue my psychedelic education in Brazil. <laughs> Asking him for his trust and his blessing. Now, he was familiar with my work as being kind of dark and colorless, whereas now this new interdimensional cultural influence was shining through. And his unconditional love turned to an unconditional trust. He saw me off at the airport, hovering around me like a little hummingbird, buzzing his maternal concerns, things like, did you bring a toothbrush? <laughs> and he realized that he had to let me go on my own path. His little boy going off to the universal university. To be called before the creative principle. To pay intuition. To attain a PhD in DMT. And so I ventured out, forfeiting all things familiar in favor of the mystery. Just me and an imaginary friend. Just me and an imaginative plant. Just me and my anima, chronicling my transformation at brushstroke speed. <laughs> 